Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this ShredGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be kicking this video off with several pieces of Intel news before moving on to some console-related topics, and the console's topics are actually pretty cool. But I really want to talk about a rumour that has popped up thanks to HardwareLux.de, and Andreas Schilling was discussing things with some of his sources. And according to him, Intel will not be releasing any 10nm CPUs at all for the desktop. So the first non-14nm CPU that we will receive for the desktop will be the 7nm based Meteor Lake. But Meteor Lake for Intel will not launch until 2022. So I decided to reach out to my sources, and after a bit of digging around, I got it confirmed that Andreas is most likely correct, because my source had heard the very same thing. Now, I 100% certain that Rocket Lake does succeed Comet Lake. The reason I'm so certain about this is, back in, I believe it was February that I released the video, I released a video that the Ryzen 3000 series and Narve were going to launch in, well, July, July 7th. So uh, the same source also told me that Comet Lake would be succeeding uh, Coffee Lake. And Comet Lake would be 10 processor cores up to 20 threads. And they gave me some other bits and pieces that I, of course, discussed in that video. I was also then told that Rocket Lake would be the successor to Comet Lake. Uh, but also, there's another very interesting thing that kind of backs this up anyway, and that was a leaked roadmap. So, a leaked roadmap by the website, uh, website, excuse me, tweakers.net, basically shows the uh, release desktop products from Intel from 2019 up until 2021. And you can see right there that Rocket Lake is indeed the successor to, um, to, Com uh, to uh, Comet Lake. So obviously with Coffee Lake, we have 8, uh, eight cores, 16 threads. Comet Lake bumps us up to 10, 10 cores, 20 threads. I've also heard there's going to be higher clock frequency. There may be some hardware mitigations to the, the vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities. That's one of the things I've heard. I've also seen various benchmarks that I covered a few days ago that even the i3s have hyper-threading, which is obviously a really good thing. Uh, there was a 4-core, 8-thread processor. Whether that means that all of Intel's um, uh, Comet Lake SKUs are going to have hyper-threading, I don't know. But it's still going to have the Gen, uh, Gen 9.5 uh, GPU and it, iGPU. And the release date for this, from what uh, has leaked so far, looks to be the first quarter of next year. Uh, looks like volume production is starting around Christmas-ish this year, late December. And that means that we will have the CPUs probably on store shelves by February, maybe March-ish next year. So it's going to be fascinating to see what Intel can squeeze out of Comet Lake. The curious one is Rocket Lake, and I honestly wish I knew more about this. Most people think that it is based on the Skylake architecture, but I and everyone else just scratch our head and kind of go, uh, when people act, when people then ask the inevitable question, well, what the heck is the difference between Comet Lake and Rocket Lake? I don't know if it's more processor cores once again. I'm just throwing it out there, but maybe it's 12 CPU cores. Maybe, maybe more. Maybe they're getting rid of the iGPU for all I know. But that doesn't make sense because from what I'm hearing, it has a generation 12 iGPU. Um, that was based upon some driver information that leaked. So I don't really know what they're doing with Rocket Lake, to be totally honest. There were some other theories that Rocket Lake is actually a backported later architecture, for example, Sunny Cove. But I don't know if that's actually accurate, to be honest. And no one I've spoken to in terms of my sources has confirmed it. Most people have kind of scratched their head. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, Meteor Lake, however, as I mentioned, is the first uh, 7nm uh, CPU, or rather non-14nm uh, CPU from Intel. As far as I'm aware, it's based on Ocean Cove, uh, the Ocean Cove architecture, which means it's obviously going to be really impressive in terms of a leap 
from a Skylake based architecture, assuming that is what we have, um, uh, with Rocket Lake. Obviously, that's not confirmed yet, but assuming it is a Skylake based architecture, and then we're you're kind of going several generations of CPU into the future, it's going to be really impressive as a leap. But the problem is, obviously, that's going to be 2022. So this means that AMD, uh, I'm going to leave out the server market, and I'm also going to mo- leave out the HGDT market, because quite frankly, this would become such a long video if I started to do that analysis, and it's out the scope of this video. I'll discuss that in a separate video in the future, because uh, I do have some information on that, but I'd rather discuss it in a separate video, um, because this one's already going to be lengthy enough. So... I- it's going to be very interesting to see what Intel do, quite frankly. Um, there's been so many rumours that they've set aside $3 billion to fight AMD, and I've actually heard that confirmed as well by one of my sources, uh, the $3 billion mark. Uh, I believe Amy covered that yesterday. Um, so yeah, it's going to be just really interesting to see what happens, because next year... AMD will be launching the Zen 3 architecture, and my source has told me, another source, has told me that the IPC gains for Zen 3 are at least 8%, and it also has higher clock frequencies. I don't know if it's got any additional processor cores, um, to be honest, uh, with the uh, Ryzen lineup. Once again, I'm taking out server markets and all of that stuff, just focusing purely on the mainstream segment of the market. So, uh, obviously after that, there's an entirely new socket from AMD. They will no longer be having AM4 based, and it will then move, of course, to the Zen 4 architecture. And presumably we're going to see other shifts as well, um, such as PCIe 5, um, probably uh, DDR5 as well. I was about to say GDDR5, but no DDR5. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be quite different in terms of the... Uh, in, in, in terms of the offering that AMD have at that point. So the thing about the thing about Intel though is that they have a tendency to hit back really hard. And obviously this is not a good look for Intel in the short term, but I don't think it's doom and gloom by any stretch of the imagination. I just think that it's going to be a couple of years where Intel will sweat. The thing is, though, Intel have been in this position before. I mean, if you recall, I mean, this is this is very off topic with the tech side of things, but this is just kind of me uh, thinking back a little bit. But if you recall back, like, um, let's say the Pentium Two, and this is definitely going quite far back, you know, kind of mid to late nineties, Intel were incredibly dominant. You had the Pentium Two. That was basically just ruffle stomping the K62, and I say that as a K62 owner back in the day. And then obviously AMD launched the K63, which had some improvements. And then we also had the Pentium 3 from Intel. And yes, there are some time overlaps here. But Pentium 3 was, you know, a nice improvement over the Pentium 2. And then AMD just kind of came out of nowhere with the original Athlon. And then Intel and AMD were kind of trading blows, and it was very debatable of whether you wanted to go with a Pentium 3 or an or a uh, Athlon-based CPU. The Athlons were incredibly popular, um, uh, particularly for people at that point was probably upgrading from the like 300A Celerons that were, you know, overclocked to like 450, 500 megahertz. They were getting a bit long in the tooth for that point, so. You had that kind of like, do I go with AMD? Do I go with Intel? And then after that, AMD really hit back hard with like the, 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 the Barton CPUs. And then obviously, uh, Intel with the Pentium 4s, with, uh, the Pentium 4 hyper threading CPUs. They kind of launched those because of the long, uh, pipeline with the Pentium 4 uh, architecture or so, the Netburst architecture, excuse me. And then AMD just absolutely like, kind of dropped, uh, like, just dropped a nuke when they launched uh, the Athlon 64s, and then uh, Intel, just for a while, particularly in the gaming workloads, were just not able to compete. And so it's kind of like this back and forward where we also saw uh, AMD then launch the dual-core processors, and then AMD just kind of started to fall behind when uh, Intel then started to launch CPUs like the Core 2 
lying on. That was definitely a, a really impressive series of CPUs. But anyway, enough talking about the past. Uh, but my point is, though, it's going to be fascinating to see what Intel actually do here. And on the final subject of Intel for today, Intel have clarified the ray tracing acceleration for its XT line of GPUs. So you might recall that there was a Intel developer conference recently that was taking place in Tokyo. And the director of uh, technology there, the, uh, Kenshiro Yasuo, hopefully I pronounced his name correctly, had confirmed, in quotation marks, ray tracing would be on the GPU, but that appears to not be accurate. According to PC Games N, Yasu himself never actually touched upon the subject, and it was, quote, wrongly attributed due to poor translation from the source material, end quote. And this was a statement that Intel have actually issued, uh, and this was to IT Home. So this means that ray tracing is not on the XE line of cards, right? Well, kind of yes and kind of no, because Intel then also reiterated that there will be a ray tracing with its professional rendering platform on Intel XE. But when it comes to the gaming side of things, it doesn't look like ray tracing is going to be on XE. So that's as clear as mud. Ray traced mud, though. But then we also have Intel's One API rendering toolkit, which is being implemented into games such as World of Tanks, which means that we have DX11 ray tracing, albeit not as comprehensive as a hardware dedicated ray tracing solution, like let's say Nvidia's RTX. And now in the final couple of pieces of news, we're going to be discussing the PlayStation 5 and next generation console stuff. The PS5 is first, and this First piece of information comes to us via Bits and Chips, uh, the English Twitter account. According to the post, PlayStation 5 will utilize a semi-custom Zen 2 core, aka Zen 2 Plus, end quote. Now, unfortunately, the customizations were not clarified here. It's potentially possible that it will be, I guess the best way of describing it would be a hybrid approach, a bit like a cross between a Zen 2 and a Zen 3 core, so kind of like halfway between the two, um, which would kind of make sense given the time frame of the PlayStation 5's release, and I'm assuming that the next generation Xbox is likely to utilise this approach as well. After all, the PS5 doesn't launch until Christmas next year, and we can bet that Zen 3 would be basically shipping at that point. And there's not a release date yet that I have for uh, Zen 3 products, but we can guess that it's going to be before Christmas next year that we see the Ryzen uh, 4000 series and blah, 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 blah. I think one area that is almost certainly to be cut down would be the cache. I suspect that level 3 cache will take a big hit because for gaming, level 3 cache is great and all, but... It also eats lots of die space. I've discussed this quite at length before in my Xbox Scarlet analysis video, and I also discussed it in my Zen 2 analysis video, so I don't want to go over it too much here. But basically, in terms of the eight CPU cores that is in the next generation consoles and the balance of level 3 cache, the level 3 cache is, like, you know, basically the same size. It's just ridiculous. Um, so... For them to cut down the 32 megabytes of cache of uh, level 3 down to like 16 megabytes makes an awful lot of sense. Still gives them lots of cache on um, for the CPU and just also gives them a lot of additional die space to do other things with like additional GPU cores. So yeah, I think that that one's a pretty much a no-brainer. So, one of the big questions, of course, when you move from one generation of hardware to the next generation of hardware is, well, what's going to be the visual difference? What's going to be the difference in terms of the gameplay? What is it going to be able to accomplish? Well, this stuff is not technical in that we don't have the number of T-flops, but according to a post on Reset Era by a Game Fan magazine editor, actually a former Game Fan magazine, magazine editor, I'm having one of those days, I can't speak. Um, 
he actually... Well, I'm going to let his words explain the story. The demo I saw had the very best real-time graphics I've ever seen. And what I mean by that is it looked like a real game you can play. Not some super polished UE4 or Unity technical demo that you would just see at GDC. To me, there was no mistaking this for a current generation or P PC or console to be clear in terms of scope, lighting and environmental effects. Red Dead Redemption 2 or Last of Us 2 aren't even in the same time zone as this. So yeah, it was kind of like Shadowfall moment to me in that it seemed totally different from what I'm used to in the previous generation. Now granted, frame rates were maybe 25 to 30-ish, and it was early, 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 but I actually said out loud WTF when I first saw it. He then added in a separate post, one thing that was really interesting to me was the quality of the shadows. I especially noticed there were approximately two to three high uh, bushes. When they were swaying in the wind, they were casting moving shadows with... Um, explicit, perfect detail, no shimmering or stair-stepping. And I'm talking about a bush with maybe 75 to 100 branches and hundreds of leaves on it, casting perfect, explicit shadows. Keep in mind, this was just a random bush. Also, the overall picture quality was astoundingly solid, like some super-duper AAA. The game is 26, 2160p, 4K, but again, no shimmering whatsoever. Just a really solid resolve to the graphics. He added it was running on a Narve based hardware, so a current for the time PS5 development kit as of June 2019. You can also probably say that this would be pretty much the same thing with the next generation Xbox as well. To be honest, I just want to see some footage myself at this point. I want to see what the next generation consoles are going to be capable of. And also I'm curious to see how this is going to impact PC. The only footage we've really had of the PS5 would be the Spider-Man demo, at least to my knowledge. And the Spider-Man demo was, well, PS4 stuff. The only difference is they basically just removed the speed limiters so that the game would play as fast as possible. So you could see the stuttering on the PS4 version relative to the smoothness of how fast uh, the PS5 version would just be able to kind of keep up with Spider-Man. And obviously that did look really impressive in terms of the speed of how fast it was pulling data off the SSD. But yeah, uh, as for the Xbox, we've seen some Halo footage. Uh, and it did look really impressive, to be fair. I will say that the next generation Halo looked really impressive. There were a couple of graphical oddities here and there that did not, at least to my eye, I didn't catch any ray tracing. There was a couple of areas where... For a moment, I was like, ooh, is that ray tracing? Maybe? Maybe? Eh, no, no, I don't think it is. But, you know, it it did look really nice. But obviously, that was kind of a, a well, it, yeah, it was a very early implementation of the game. So, obviously, they've still got, like, I don't know, 18-ish months of the time of that demo to, to kind of polish it. Then it's certainly going to look a lot better. Anyway, hopefully, you've enjoyed the video. I'm going to let you all go. But I thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.